Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, <laughs> we just extend our faith one more time. And I extend the authority of Jesus Christ vested in us to declare the glory and the works available through the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I speak to every physical illness that would be represented here this morning. Every person challenged with an issue that is assaulting their physical body. I, I declare in Jesus' name that the name of Jesus is greater than any illness and the spirit behind any of these illnesses. And in Jesus' name, I just declare healing, healing. I speak against any deterioration that is ongoing. And I say to this illness that you stop. I speak healing to physical bodies that the physical body would no longer deteriorate, but it would begin to improve in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I command this to be. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I invoke healing and I declare that over my brothers and sisters here. Healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Healing in emotions, healing in the mind, healing from depression, healing from anxiety, in Jesus' name. Healed from nagging questions that bring doubt and darkness. Healed and delivered from the influence of any kind of a wrong spirit that we wouldn't even know that he is there, but he just causes unrest and discomfort and confusion. I speak against those spirits that would try to come and in a sneaky way deal with us. I speak against them and I shed the light of Jesus Christ, the truth of his word in every situation against every question. Hallelujah. I just speak freedom, freedom, freedom over my brothers and sisters. Freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 And this morning we extend our prayers to the nation of Israel. We speak hope to those people. Hope. And I pray that other nations will come to their defense and not abandon them. I speak hope to the people of that country that they would not be anxious. But in, in spite of the hardship and the toil that they are under, that they would have a quiet hope, that their joy and strength would not be diminished in Jesus' name and they could come to know the true and living Savior as we have come to know him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you be encouraged if you're toiling with stuff. Hallelujah, be encouraged, expect uh, Expect a good report from your doctor. Hallelujah. Amen. So for a long time now, we've been talking about the church. Somebody would have asked me a couple months ago if I could talk for a couple months on the church. I would have said, well, I could probably pull off maybe two sermons if I'm lucky. And uh, so we're still talking about the church. And... And I don't want to be misunderstood uh, as to assume that I'm picking on anybody or any religious organization. Uh, I, 
I really want this message to be an encouragement to us who are here. I, I want to be heard that I'm talking to the choir, not to someone who is not here. Hallelujah. Or on the same page as we are. So m my message is, like, if this is your first time here, or you've been skipping a few Sundays, uh, you may have trouble sort of tying everything together because I, I certainly can't preach the same message and then add another message to it. So uh, much of what I've been saying for weeks now is one message built on another and we just connect the dots and keep on going. And, and something that, that is worth mentioning, and I do want to highlight this, is is what Jesus said in Matthew 16 when he said, I, I will build my church. Uh, like he, he just emphatically said, I will build my church. Um, what we have an understanding of as church today, Jesus did not say that. There is something that Jesus did not say. First of all, he did not say, I will build my church. Uh, that word church got inserted in the 13th century. And that's not what Jesus said. What, what Jesus did say is he took an example, <clears throat> a, a, a political example from that day, which everybody understood. And it, it was a form of government and every community had this form of government, and it was a designated group of men, probably, uh, not ladies, uh, who were kind of the officials. They were the heads of the community. And, and, and when there was an issue, an assembly was called, and then it was dealt with, whatever the issue was, and we looked at examples of that from the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts and you'll know what I'm talking about. And so that's what Jesus was talking about. What church is today, uh, no. I can hear Jesus saying, I didn't say that, I didn't say that, I said this. So to illustrate my point, let me go back in Canadian history. In the late 80s, the early 90s, what was known as the Conservative Party was not serving the needs of the people of Canada. A man, Preston Manning, son of a Alberta politician, rose up and he said, I am going to build a political party that will serve the needs of the people who call themselves conservative. And so in a few short years, he pulled off an absolute miracle, an absolute miracle, that in the 90s, he built a party that became a leading party in Canada. And in the next election, in 2006, Stephen Harper became the Prime Minister of Canada. And if you would listen to an interview where Preston Manning is interviewed <clears throat> by someone who understands the system and how miraculous this was, it is entirely incredible that across the entire nation of Canada that a man developed a political party that won the next election. And in that election, uh, they won 124 seats, the Reform Party, and the Liberal Party, 103. Entirely amazing. That's what Jesus did with the political party, except his political party was a spiritual one, a spiritual one, a spiritual one. We hear lots about um, how God loves the land of Israel, right? We've heard that just lots, 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 lots. Do you know that in the same way God has his eye on the church? 
Same way he loves Israel, he has that same affection to the assembled body of Christ. There are people who are Jewish, but they do not live in Israel. They come under a certain blessing because of their lineage, but they will not come under the full blessing that the nation of Israel comes under. For example, when Jesus returns, he's coming back to Israel, the land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. He's not going to New York, where there is a lot of Jews living. He's going to the land of Israel. So the people of Israel, the land of Israel, comes under a very definite blessing. There are Christians, there are people who identify as Christian, who do not uh, adhere to a local body of Christ. They're still Christian. Their lineage goes all the way back to what Jesus accomplished on the cross, but they are excluded from certain blessings that are peculiar to the assembled body of believers. And that's a fact. Hallelujah. You'd be shocked to know that I got three pages staring at me. Normally I have one and a half or two. So don't think of sneaking out on me. The doors will be locked till I'm done. <laughs> there was a day when, uh, and still is actually, some boys never grow up when there's a big mud hole. If you didn't make it through with the quad, it's because you weren't going fast enough. So I got a bit of a run on this one. We're going to make her through. So just hang on. In, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, I want to read a lengthy passage here. And <clears throat> let me say up front, so the women have a unique word. It's their S word. It's the word submit. But let me be an encouragement to you women and uh, maybe a downer to you men. Well, again, I'm not talking to the right people here because all of you folks are so wonderful and perfect. I'm not convinced that this scripture is, is giving us marital instruction. I'm not at all convinced that that's the motive here, but so let's wander through it and we'll collect our thoughts. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For as a husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body which he is the Savior. Now the church submits to, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the washing of the word to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I'm not convinced that that is talking about husbands and wives. I'm not at all convinced because in verse 32 it says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So what Paul is doing here is he is taking an example of a very good husband-wife relationship. And he's trying to illustrate the relationship we have with Christ the church, he's using a good marital relationship to demonstrate what it's like to be connected to Christ. I mean, that's good material if you want to 
tell somebody how they should live, like, hey, wife, the book says submit with a capital S, if no less. No, well, yeah, you can use that for that if you want. And you can use it for good too. There's, there's some good concepts there because we are talking about our relationship with God, Christ, and there is a, obviously valuable concepts there. But I'm not convinced that that was given for instruction to husbands and wives. It is a profound mystery, our relationship with, with Christ, and to understand it, to know what a good relationship is between a husband and wife, that really helps to understand a relationship with God. So, let's talk about marriage for example, for a moment. And let's see the parallel between that and our relationship with Christ. A good marriage, when both people are really sincere with the Lord, and and I'm talking about a Christian marriage, this is where you really see it shine. In, in, In a good marriage scenario, the husband recognizes the qualities in his wife. He recognizes that and he helps her develop them. He pushes her forward. The wife recognizes the qualities in her husband. She recognizes that. She understands what that means. She pushes him forward. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The longer they're married, the further up they're getting pushed. The the assumption is that we really want to go forward with God. And when two people really want to go forward with God, it's unimaginable what can be accomplished in that relationship. And it's not just what would be seen, say, in my example where I'm up here, or in my wife's example when when she's up here frequently, whatever she's doing, but behind the scenes, these two people, what they can accomplish through prayer is unimaginable unimaginable in our relationship with Christ if we if we can just have an understanding of what Christ accomplished on our behalf and we recognize the gifting that is there and we dare to start pushing that forward and then he looks back at us and he says oh And he starts pushing us forward, and we say, oh, and we start pushing him forward. There is no limit. It is beyond our imagination what can be accomplished in that kind of a relationship. Hallelujah. It's been well said. Oh, sorry, iron sharpens iron. Iron does not sharpen plastic, and plastic does not sharpen iron. Young people, you be careful who you marry. You be careful who you marry. Iron does not sharpen plastic, and plastic does not sharpen iron. Hallelujah. So let's look at those two verses. Ephesians 26 and 27. So this is what Jesus wants to accomplish to the church. He wants to make her holy. To present her to himself as a radiant church. 
I want you to notice it does not say the church. It says a church. This is critical. Not the church. It says a church. There are many churches out there that if we did not call them a church or allowed them to fly under that banner, they would be greatly offended, greatly offended. But is Jesus saying the church or is he saying a church? The Mormon people, they identify as a church. They say that this book is incomplete and the writings of Joseph Smith add further revelation to what this book is missing. They also say that Jesus is a spirit brother to Lucifer. They're brothers. One turned out good, one turned out bad. Oh, but they say Jesus is the son of God and that he died for our sin. Jehovah Witness, they say that Jesus is not a part of the Trinity, that he is a lesser God. There are churches who once flew in a, a, a credible gospel flag who now embrace the homosexual agenda and promote it. There is a church that was established in the 60s called the Church of Satan. <laughs> and they even celebrate Christmas. They say Christians stole it from the pagans. So they celebrate Christmas. There are churches who entirely reject. Um, and these are all churches. They'd be offended if someone said, well, you're not a church. There are churches that entirely reject the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Are they churches? Well, absolutely they're churches. Well, absolutely they're churches. But are they what Jesus talked about in Matthew 16? No. No. They're a church, but they're not what he talked about. Jesus didn't use the word church. That word came into existence. It first shows up in the 13th century. Reason being the word that Jesus used was culturally understood and it was it was the norm of the day everybody understood well they didn't understand what he meant they thought he's going to rise up and become a political leader and kick the Romans out but he wasn't talking about that he was talking about a spiritual political party by the 13th century the Roman Empire was in drastic decline. The Western part of the Roman Empire had already collapsed. There was the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western. The Western had already collapsed. The Eastern collapsed in the 14th century. Or was it the late 13th? Let me check. Need a spirit of discernment here. It's lacking. 
either in the 13th century or the 14th, the Eastern one went down. So it was no longer culturally relevant to use this example because nobody understood it. It no longer existed. But what did exist was the word church. And that's what shows up in our Bibles. That's what showed up in the first Bible that was translated or printed rather. And later when the King James Bible came out, which served us for 300 years, that was the word used. That's not the word that Jesus used. And it's not the concept that Jesus had in mind. The word church literally means a physical structure. So Jesus says, I am going to make my church, my body of believers holy, and they will be presented to me as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle. There is something we could say about being holy. The word holy, it just simply means to be set apart, set apart. When that example of a husband and wife is used to illustrate a relationship with God, When I married my wife, I set her apart. She was no longer available to anybody or I'd beat him up. And if I erred in being set apart, she'd beat me up. We're holy to each other, we're we're set apart. I'm set apart to her. She's set apart to me. What does it mean to be holy to God? There used to be a movement. It came out of the revival in 1906 where a holiness movement um, was formed and We hear all sorts of horror stories about that movement, but we hear them about every movement. So maybe they took them to the extreme, I don't know, but whatever. The barn needs painting, paint it. Whatever, need a chandelier, hang one on. (sighs) Whatever. Whether that's the the holiness that God was requiring, Whatever. (laughs) You have your own opinion on that anyway, so I'm not even going to touch it. What does it mean to be holy, to be set apart? In a man's world, we have men talk. I don't know what women do. They probably talk about recipes or something. Men are kind of crude. And I've witnessed this over the years when Christian men frequently are hanging out, particularly if there's a non-believer in their midst, they talk different than they would Sunday morning. Really? We call it, well, call it what you want. It's some kind of men talk where They speak out of both sides of their mouth at the same time. That is not holy. That is not holy. I have not been perfect in my life with my words, but there are lots of stories and lots of jokes that I have heard that will die with me. I will never repeat them. I will never repeat them. And there's lots of words that are quite acceptable to say, coarse language, off color, stuff that you probably wouldn't hear here 
And if you did, somebody would notice and somebody would look at somebody and say, holy, holy. What does it mean to be holy? Yeah, there's something to be said about that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I don't know if I'm on page three, four, or five. The doors are going to be locked, so don't get any ideas. Hallelujah. You know, there's stuff that goes on in... In, in, in the live, lives of Christian people and in the life of the church, that if it happened under the Old Testament umbrella, if it happened in that day, whoa, we would smell bacon. So we live in the age of grace, in the era of grace. The, the Bible clearly says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a puzzle to me. If God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and if people were judged so quickly and harshly, under the law in the Old Testament era, why today do we get away with stuff? And, and the classic Christian response is, well, it's the age of grace and Jesus paid for it all and somehow we're off we can get away with stuff. How come Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira didn't get away with it? These are the two, right? If you remember the story, they lied about their finances. And pff, this was during the church age. Hey, this is New Testament. This is after Jesus complete. Like, this is the church. That kind of puzzles me, and I don't really have many answers on that. But one thing I know for sure is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when I look what happens in the church and what individuals do and call it good, I think, well, buddy, you're lucky that it's the age of grace and not under the Old Testament or you'd probably get dealt with harshly and quickly. So for me personally, it's a reminder that we probably should not be doing stuff that they did in the Old Testament for which they got judged. We probably shouldn't go there. Because God probably still doesn't like that stuff. We probably shouldn't do it. And to think that we actually get away with participating in these activities. Hmm. If God is a just God, somehow we probably don't get away with it. It's kind of like this. The age of grace, where Jesus has made a way that we can be connected with God, that, that we are presentable before him, that our sin is forgiven. It's like we have an umbrella, and we carry a grace umbrella wherever we go. And as long as we stay under that umbrella, 
we're safe. We're safe. But if we participate in what they got nailed for in the Old Testament, I think that umbrella gets put to the side. Be careful, be careful, be careful, be careful. And it's not so much that God will judge us, because I don't think it works that way anymore. But there's somebody else out there who is just looking for an opportunity, an opportunity when the grace umbrella is gone, we get hit with something from darkness. And I think that's how it works now. (sighs) Hallelujah. In In Leviticus, chapter 10, it talks about the sons of Aaron when they brought strange fire into the temple. So they had a uh, incense container like a pot and they had fire in there and that burned the incense and that was a part of the sacrificial procedure before the Lord. It's assumed, it's not clearly said, but where you got the fire from was the altar. It doesn't say where they got the fire from, but they were supposed to get it from the altar. The assumption is they got it from somewhere else. Maybe one of them had a big lighter in their pocket. The assumption is it didn't come from the altar. And when it's referred to as strange fire, and when that came into the temple, both them boys, right now. So today, many individuals would be greatly insulted if we tried to convince them they were not a church. Strange fire, strange fire, strange fire. He's taking a holiday. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. So we're two scriptures that are still up on the screen. This is what Jesus wants to do. What he is doing and he wants to do. He wants to make us holy cleansing us by the washing with water through the word to present us to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, any other blemish, but holy and blameless, holy and blameless, holy. And I see this as a two-part deal. I honestly do just like in a good husband-wife relationship. It's a two-part deal. As a good man partners with his good wife and she partners back and they just exalt each other, they worship each other, if you know what the word worship means, and they just push each other forward more and more and year after year after year, as that is a a partnership, and they are holy unto each other, and they adore each other, they worship each other, in the very same way, it works that way with us in Christ. We recognize what he has to offer, he recognizes what we have to offer, and I speak as us before him as individuals first 
And as we develop, no, as we recognize what he has to offer, he recognizes the giftings in us and he helps us develop our giftings. And then we recognize what he has to offer back and then we connect with that and he connects back and we connect there and he connects here and we go higher and we worship him and we become holy unto him. Hallelujah. <laughs> it is beyond our imagination what we can become, what we can achieve, the, the level of fulfillment, the level of satisfaction, the joy of being a blessing, the joy of being valuable. It's beyond our imagination where this could go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To recognize what Jesus came to do and how he has equipped us through the Holy Spirit, the authority of the Holy Spirit to achieve his work, that we can be a part of this political party that he began. It's a political party, a spiritual political party. Nothing more, nothing less. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God here on earth. And to participate in that <laughs> just yields something that is just beyond this world. Beyond this world. I conclude with this thought, which I've shared before. At the hardest relationship that two people can engage in, a man and a woman here on earth, is a marriage relationship. It's the hardest, for sure. But done properly, it yields the best results. The best, the highest, the highest, the most fulfilling results possible here on earth. The hardest thing to achieve with God is a love relationship. It is the hardest, the absolute hardest. But if that can be accomplished, wow, it is beyond our imagination. The scope of fulfillment, satisfaction, achievement, value, purpose, destiny. Like there is just no end to it. It is beyond our imagination. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Father, I just bless this group of people as we stand before you with an open heart, wanting more, desiring to be a radiant church. I just bless these people that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened that we would see the hope to which we are called and the, the great blessing and ability and purpose and destiny that awaits us if we will just recognize what you have for us and we lean in that direction and allow you to recognize our abilities and you develop us and we begin this amazing journey together where we promote you and you promote us. <laughs> I just bless this family with this understanding in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. And thank you for miraculous healings as we prayed earlier. Thank you, God. I extend this to every person here who struggles in Jesus' name, healing and health healing and health in the name of the Lord. Amen.